Stories from the pages of time. Stories of triumph and tragedy, adventure and achievement as we go in search of history. Los Alamos, New Mexico, birthplace of the atom bomb. In the early 1940s, a brilliant 19-year-old Harvard physics student was selected to work on the top secret project that would change the world. A committed communist, the young scientist would become a spy, and some say, leak information as damaging as that which convicted spies Julius and Ethel Rosenberg passed to the Soviet Union. He's gotten away with giving the secrets of the atomic bomb to the Soviet Union, and uh, he's gotten away with the crime that uh, the Rosenbergs were executed for. Ted Hall was never caught, never prosecuted. Join us as we go in search of history and discover the incredible story of the boy who gave away the bomb. The year was 1939, the beginning of a volatile period in world history. In September 1939, Nazi forces invaded Poland and World War II began. But in the United States, it was business as usual. Though Hitler was viewed as a threatening force, isolationism kept the U.S. from intervening. It's 1939 in Queens, New York. 13-year-old Ted Hall was making his bar mitzvah. Though the family name was Holtzberg, Ted and his brother Edward, 10 years older, changed their last name to Hall. It was Edward's idea. He was having difficulty finding work. It was the Depression era that was a part of it, but he really felt, the older brother, that he was at a disadvantage because he has a Jewish name. And it was identifiable, and he felt that it was causing him trouble. Ted Hall was no ordinary American adolescent. For his 12th birthday, he had asked his mother for one gift, a book titled The Mysterious Universe by visionary British physicist Sir James Jeans. The book fired Ted's imagination and heightened an already intense interest in physics. His precociousness was also exhibited in an interest in communism. Ted voraciously consumed left-wing literature brought home by his brother. At 13, he joined a group of student socialists called the American Student Union. Ted was a rebel, and he was not alone. This was a decade in the 1930s during the Depression in which hundreds of thousands of people went in and out of the Communist Party. When over a million Americans in 1932 in the election which Franklin Roosevelt first became president voted f uh, in effect against capitalism. They voted either for the Socialist Party or the Communist Party uh, candidates for president. Uh, within this framework, uh, you could find every species of radical known to man in New York City at the time. Not yet 15, Hall was accepted to Queens College in New York and quickly showed his genius for physics. In an interview, he spoke of his dual allegiances. I remember thinking that what I would like to do was to have really two careers. I would like one career to be sort of in an ivory tower where you could just enjoy theoretical physics abstractly. I also felt that I had a social debt that people should do things which would benefit humanity. So, I felt I would try to balance my career. That balancing act continued when Hall transferred to Harvard University and became one of a dozen active participants in the John Reed Society, a communist organization. It was 1942, and his interest in communism had already been heightened by Hitler's invasion of the Soviet Union ending a two-year non-aggression pact. The Communist Party was uh, a real alternative for many people uh, in, the, in the 1930s. It seemed to be 
uh, presenting an alternative that uh, the Democrats and the Republicans weren't. During the same year, construction had begun in Los Alamos, New Mexico, on a top secret complex. As part of the Manhattan Project, a facility was being fashioned to create the world's first atomic bomb. U.S. Army General Leslie Groves, having just completed overseeing the construction of the Pentagon, had been placed in charge of making the bomb a reality. Physicist Robert Oppenheimer was his right-hand man. Together, they recruited the Western world's top scientists, young and old. At age 18, Hall found himself being interviewed by a mysterious man from Washington. The man would tell him only that there was a very important project that needed some more hands. When Hall returned to his dormitory after the interview, he talked of his experience with Saville Sachs, a student friend who was also involved with communist organizations. Sachs surmised that the project must have military implications. Sachs said to Hall something to the effect, hey, if this is some super weapon, maybe you ought to tell the Russians about it. Hall did not realize then that he would soon be heading for Los Alamos to participate in a project that would transform world politics. He had two quite distinct ideas in his mind. The first was, uh, my God, this is a career maker. I've been placed in the Valhalla of physicists here to, to develop my career. On January 27, 1944, 19-year-old Ted Hall arrived at Los Alamos. He had already undergone an extensive background check, which showed his interest in communism. But Hall's politics were not considered a problem. The uh, problem confronted by General Groves and others who were selecting scientists and technicians and engineers to work at one or another of the secret installations during the Second World War at which the atomic bomb was eventually constructed was not identifying the occasional <laughs> radical in the midst of this scientific community, but identifying the occasional non-radical. By the time Hall began to work at Los Alamos, the facility had been in operation for 10 months with a staff of 600. Of four Harvard recruits, he had the most important job, directly measuring the crucial properties in uranium required for a nuclear chain reaction. Within three months, Hall was promoted to a critical and more sensitive position as a team leader of the group working to develop implosion, the actual mechanism for detonating the bomb. Hall's new job gave him access to the most confidential aspects of the weapon's construction. You also have to remember the system of security that was in place at Los Alamos. Uh, Robert Oppenheimer insisted that his scientists should be able to share information freely among themselves. So within Los Alamos, there was complete freedom of information, and a 19-year-old physicist such as Ted Hall had access to as much information as the top uh, scientists on the bomb project. A passionate lover of classical music Hall spent the little free time he had listening to his favorite composition, Strauss's Ein Heldeleben, A Hero's Life, an appropriate metaphor for Hall's self-image at the time. He had two quite distinct ideas in his mind. The first was, uh, my God, this is a career maker. I've been placed in the Valhalla of physicists here to, to develop my career. Uh, at, the second, uh, at the same time, however, he may very well have been thinking, uh, my God, here is an opportunity to serve my, uh, my social interests, to serve my political values, uh, to in fact uh, share this uh, knowledge that I am gaining uh, with uh, the Soviet Union so that in effect it would not be shortchanged, it would not be put upon uh, by the Western powers after the struggle against Hitler ended. Hall's days at Los Alamos were filled with tasks of major responsibility. He had to take little strips of uranium plated on tinfoil and put them in a very delicate instrument 
and make sure he didn't drop it. If he dropped it, uh, he probably would have been kicked out of the project and the project would have been set back for three or four weeks uh, while they had to make some new uranium. On October 15, 1944, Ted Hall began two weeks of annual leave. Ostensibly, he was going home to visit his parents in New York. But by the time he departed, Hall had all but decided he would try to inform the Soviets about the existence of the secret bomb project. Years later, Hall would recall that trip back home to writers Kunstel and Albright. My decision about contacting the Soviets was a gradual one, and it was entirely my own. It was entirely voluntary, not influenced by any other individual or by any organization such as the Communist Party or the Young Communists League. I was never recruited by anyone, nor was I prompted by any personal problems. I had grown up in a very loving family and had a successful and happy life. Upon returning to New York, the young physicist met with his friend and fellow communist, Saville Sachs. Sachs was excited about Hall's plan to provide information to the Soviets and agreed to help. The only question was, how do they do it? The two of them, these two naifs, these two young uh, 19 or 20 year olds, go wandering the streets of New York trying to contact <coughs> a Soviet operative. So what they do is to uh, walk into the Soviet consulate in New York and ask for a Soviet agent, ask for a member of the Soviet intelligence service. And in fact, the Soviets are extremely suspicious of Ted Hall and his friend Savile Sachs when they come in off the street and are not prepared initially to give them a hearing. Eventually, Hall was put in contact with Sergei Kurnikov, a Soviet author and journalist well known as a military analyst for communist newspapers in New York. In fact, Kurnikov was an agent of Soviet intelligence. They met in Kurnikov's lower Manhattan apartment. Highly suspicious, Kurnikov openly challenged Hall to prove he had solid information to deliver. The scientist was prepared and handed the agent a folder containing a report he had written on Los Alamos and a list of his colleagues who were working on the atomic bomb. Hall also told Kurnikov that Saville Sachs could serve as his courier. On the day Hall was to leave New York to return to Los Alamos, he waited for his train at Penn Station. He was shocked to see the Soviet agent. Ted looks around and he sees this guy madly gesticulating toward him and sort of calling him over, waving to him. And he looks and here's Sergei Kurnikov. So he goes over. And Kurnikov uh, apparently was dispatched by uh, the, the network, the resident tour, as they call it, to, uh, to come and tell Hall, yes, you're in. As Ted was getting ready to leave, Sergei Kurnikov drew himself up in sort of a military uh, position and saluted Ted as though he were saying, you know, hats off to you, I'm saluting you for your great contribution. The first Moscow heard of Hall and Sachs was in a coded cable sent on November 12, 1944 from the New York Residentura, the Soviet spy headquarters. They assigned Theodore Hall the code name Blod, which means young. His Harvard roommate, uh, they thought of the um, the opposite, they called him Star, which in Russian means old. As Hall headed back to New Mexico, he was flushed with nervous excitement. He knew that the information he had provided Kurnikov was just enough to whet the appetite of Soviet intelligence. Now he would work toward his ultimate goal, to describe to the Soviets how to build the bomb. What Ted Hall did not know was that every single cable sent by the Soviets in the United States to their homeland was intercepted by American intelligence. Hundreds of people working near Washington, D.C. at a facility called Arlington Hall were trying to crack the complex Soviet codes 
but no progress was being made. Unlike the Germans and Japanese, whose codes were relatively simple to decipher, the Soviets were using additive key pages that changed every day. The sophisticated Soviet coding system was keeping Ted Hall's secret life a secret. But for how long? Ted Hall had been admitted into the fraternity of Soviet spies. He had not been told there were others at Los Alamos performing the same service. Klaus Fuchs, a British physicist, had already established his own information network with the Soviets. Lucky for him, a standard security check had been waived for British scientists. He came over uh, with a small team and um, really didn't go through the same uh, filter that uh, the rest of the people did and thus uh, this was done for diplomatic reasons. Uh, the British uh, asked for basically a pass for this group of people and we didn't want to um, no, we didn't want to embarrass them by saying, no, they'll have to do the same, so our State Department said, okay. And that allowed Fuchs into the very center of uh, the Los Alamos program. A third Soviet spy at Los Alamos was David Greenglass, a machinist drafted from New York to work on the bomb. Greenglass was the brother of Ethel Rosenberg. Ethel's husband, Julius, was a Soviet agent and agent handler in New York's defense industries. Not only could Ted Hall provide new information, he could corroborate that of the others. Under the direction of General Groves, security at Los Alamos was tight, but Groves would have preferred it even tighter. I think we have a culture clash here between uh, the military uh, culture and the culture of science, which is uh, uh, based on openness and uh, exchange, uh, whereas uh, General Groves heading a, a secret military program is uh, uh, after the, the very opposite things. Uh, I think they sort of split the difference by locating it lo at Los Alamos um, and putting a fence around it and uh, uh, pr watching the people uh, rather carefully. Now, of course, we know that it wasn't foolproof and that there were spies. As part of security measures at Los Alamos, each piece of outgoing mail was subject to inspection and censorship. Hall and his courier, Sachs, realized they needed their own code to communicate by mail. Noting that each man owned the same edition of Walt Whitman's Leaves of Grass, they decided to make the collection of poetry their code book. And the book was perfect to use as a code because the verses are numbered, and each verse or, or stanza has, you know, a certain number of lines in it. Let's say if Seville Sachs was going to come on December the 1st, he would pick out the first verse, line number 12, and recite that in the letter that he was sending to Ted Hall. The first rendezvous between Hall and Sachs was absurdly amateurish. The two met in Albuquerque, but instead of coming from different directions to a predefined place, the young spies approached on foot from the same direction and bumped into each other on the way, an awkward arrangement that would have appalled any KGB trainer. I don't think you could ever have called Hall a truly disciplined agent. Uh, he, uh, he was too much of an enthusiast, he was too ebullient, uh, he even engaged in discussions with other scientists at uh, Los Alamos over uh, uh, whether one should help the Soviet Union or not. Uh, you know, abstract discussions to be sure, but he still uh, blurted things out uh, forever. After reaching a private spot, Sachs removed a piece of paper from his shoe. It had been given to him by the Soviets. Written on the paper was a relatively simple query. Hall gave Sachs information of far greater significance, describing the invention of the plutonium-based atomic bomb. Hall returned to Los Alamos, anxious to procure more information, but an unexpected roadblock suddenly appeared in his path. He was drafted. He uh, showed up and uh, told the draft people, look, I think there's been some mistake here uh, because I'm wanted back there at Los Alamos. I'm, you know, my work is considered vital 
And they said, oh, kid, what are you talking about? But he gave them a number to call at Los Alamos, and sure enough, um, they told him in those uncertain terms that he was wanted, that he was a person who was vital to the national security. At Arlington Hall, code breakers were using the first computers to detect any repetitions in messages that might help them crack the complex Soviet codes. After sorting through thousands of messages, there came a sudden breakthrough. What happened in the Soviet case was that at some point in the early 40s, we believe it was from about October 41 to somewhere perhaps March of 1942, they made duplicate copies of the, of the additive key pages uh, for a short period of time, probably as an emergency, and we eventually found that there were duplicates and were able to exploit the duplicates. Otherwise, we would never have been able to make any headway whatsoever with, with the system. For the first time since working on the Soviet cable messages, code breakers had something to work with. But they were far from actually deciphering Soviet messages. 1945 was a breakthrough year for scientists at Los Alamos and for the world at large. The implosion experiments that Ted Hall and others had been working on were successful. Robert Oppenheimer announced to General Groves, now we have a bomb. In Europe, Hitler surrendered to the Allies. The United States could now concentrate on its enemy in the Pacific, the Japanese. Near dawn on July 16th, the first atom bomb was ready to be tested. At 5.30 a.m., the desert skies of New Mexico erupted with the bright flash of a mushroom cloud. Ted Hall was there. I do remember the cloud and the glowing and the thing coming up and making this tremendous light. I certainly didn't get any feeling of a heroic achievement or a Promethean accomplishment. This thing had been worked out. It looked as if it would probably work, and the explosion would probably give the expected yield. And it did. President Harry Truman and Joseph Stalin met at the Potsdam Conference at which the war in Europe was ended. Truman informed Stalin that America had a new weapon of unusual destructive force. Stalin's understated response, just a thank you and a nod, surprised the Americans, who wondered if Stalin had understood Truman's message. They did not know that Stalin had been aware of the bomb's progress for years, through the efforts of Ted Hall and other spies. In August of 1945, after American bombers dropped atomic weapons on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, the U.S. government publicly acknowledged the existence of the Los Alamos facility. Ted Hall was preparing his last, most significant transfer of material to the Soviets when his boss suddenly entered the laboratory. This was a moment of panic, and instead of inquiring what was he doing writing these papers, he uh, quickly left Hall alone, and uh, Hall was able to put them away, and it passed without incident, and through incredible luck, Hall managed to get away with uh, what could have been the event that would have uh, turned him into the FBI right at that moment. It is widely believed that Ted Hall and Savile Sachs only met once to exchange information. Soviet intelligence officials chose to replace Sachs with a woman as Hall's courier. During wartime, a woman traveling alone would attract less attention than a man who should have been in the army. That woman was Lona Cohen, a Soviet agent. Lona Cohen was sent to Albuquerque to pick up a special package from Hall. She stayed for several weeks, waiting for Mlad to make contact. Finally, the day before she was to leave, Hall showed up with papers detailing much of the work that had been accomplished at Los Alamos. Lona stuffed the papers into a Kleenex box and headed for the train station. Following the public acknowledgement that Los Alamos existed, security at the Albuquerque station was tight. Guards were stationed at every platform to check passengers and their baggage. 
When Lona saw the security measures, she quickly came up with a plan. She kind of stands there and, and she gets herself into a different personality, into a kind of a ditzy little flapper kind of person who runs up to the train at the last minute, just before it's about to leave, and the agents say, ticket, where's your ticket? And she says, ticket, I don't, where's my ticket? I can't find my ticket. In a stroke of bold brilliance, Lona handed the tissue box containing Hall's documents to the guard so that she could find her ticket. Then, feigning forgetfulness, she left the box with the guard. Her control agent later said, ask her, why did she do this? And she said, I knew the gentleman would give me back my box. And so he did, in fact, take the tissue box and give it to her just before the train rolled away. And that's how she got the papers out of there. The detailed information contained in Lona's tissue box was extremely valuable to the Soviet Union. Combined with other information from Fuchs and Greenglass, Soviet scientists were able to prepare a seven-page bomb design report that would become the basis for dividing the Earth into two competing camps for 45 years in what became known as the Cold War. I think uh, what Ted Hall and others did was to help the Soviet Union gain, build the bomb a couple of years earlier than they might otherwise have done. So therefore, it uh, resulted in a nuclear balance of power earlier than might otherwise have been the case. Had the U.S. retained its nuclear monopoly, Hall believed circumstances could well have led to a more calamitous scenario. He would express many years later, there's the other possibility that half the world would be cinders by now. In the fall of 1946, Ted Hall left Los Alamos to resume his studies, this time at the University of Chicago. Hall was given a positive letter of recommendation from Robert Oppenheimer. In the letter, Oppenheimer indicated that Hall had performed his work with intelligence and care. Hall's scientific abilities were praised. There was no indication that Hall had violated trust or security. We haven't found anyone who said they ever suspected that Ted Hall would have engaged in espionage. In fact, all of the people we've talked to who knew him in those days were rather surprised. At the University of Chicago, Ted Hall met Joan Crackover, an 18-year-old Chicago native who had been admitted to the university at 15. As Joan later explained in an interview, she had found her match in Ted Hall. I was madly in love, and I knew in my bones that I would not meet his equal if I lived to be a hundred. He was 21, beautiful, brilliant, charming in a quiet, modest way, with a unique sense of humor and a mental lucidity I had never found in anyone else. Ted Hall felt the same. They made plans to marry, so Hall revealed his past. Joan's love for Ted cast a positive light over her fiancé's life as a spy. After Hall's revelation, Joan had convinced herself that the Soviet Union was good and any negative reports were fabrications. It never entered her mind that Hall had done something wrong. They were a perfect match for each other. The couple joined the Communist Party and became openly politically active. Hall knew this decision would mean the end to his work as a Soviet spy. He wrote his friend Savile Sachs back in New York to tell Kurnikov that his espionage days were over. Hall did not know, however, that at Arlington Hall, the codebreakers had made major leaps forward. In what came to be known as the Venona Project, Soviet cable documents had been deciphered and names began to be revealed. The material emerges in a situation like that, a scrap at a time, a few words, a couple of words, you spell out a name, you, uh, it'll be months, maybe not, be months before you complete the, the name, you maybe get even a fragment of a name. What's interesting about 
the way we broke that code, one of the most important intelligence breakthroughs of the 20th century, is that it was all done by individuals and pads of paper. The tedious efforts of Arlington Hall's code breakers paid off just as news was spreading that radioactive samples collected over the Pacific hinted at a Soviet atomic explosion. On September 23, 1949, President Truman announced that the Soviets had indeed conducted an atomic explosion. Deciphered documents first pointed to the espionage work of Klaus Fuchs, who was then a chief scientist at Britain's top-secret Harwell Nuclear Center. Scotland Yard detectives placed Fuchs under constant surveillance and questioned him intensely every week for several months. On February 2nd, 1950, Fuchs confessed. What really apparently got to him was a fear that his sister, Crystal, who was living in the United States at the time, would have problems with the authorities. That she would be put under pressure and it just would be too much for her to bear. And that seems to be one of the things that went into the equation that finally convinced him that he needed to, to confess. For Ted Hall and Savile Sachs, it was fortunate that the FBI first chose to investigate the espionage work of Klaus Fuchs. Hall came under pressure from the Soviets to return to espionage work. He had again placed himself in a position highly useful to the Soviets. Under the direction of physicists Edward Teller and Enrico Fermi, the University of Chicago had become the center of the American program to build the next stage of devastating weaponry, the hydrogen bomb. Against the wishes of his wife, Hall agreed to resume his life as a spy. But he denies providing the Soviets with any new information. That's one thing he's very uh, insistent about, that he's never helped them with the hydrogen bomb, that he didn't himself know about the hydrogen bomb. In fact, that he was revolted by the whole idea of a hydrogen bomb. But uh, in any case, we believe that that's the reason the Russians wanted him back. A year later, with no warning whatsoever, Hall decided again to end his double life. He rejoined communist organizations in Chicago and became politically active. At the same time, Arlington Hall codebreakers reported that a 19-year-old physicist named Theodore Cole from Harvard had given information on Camp 2, the code name for Los Alamos, to Sergei Kurnikov. This one document was more incriminating to Hall than any single decrypted cable that Arlington Hall had ever found on Fuchs. But it did not reveal what information Hall might have given away. Chicago FBI agents began tailing Ted Hall. Robert McQueen was one of those agents. The surveillance didn't show that he was actively engaged at a, as an espionage agent at, that, at this time. And we further thought that he probably wasn't active because he was involved in these front organizations. And we knew from past experience that the agent uh, who was acting as a spy does not let himself get uncovered so to speak, by being observed uh, doing something which, which uh, was apparent to law enforcement authorities. The name Savile Sachs had also been discovered during the deciphering process at Arlington Hall. The FBI brought both Hall and Sachs in for questioning. Agents talked with each man separately for nearly three hours. Robert McQueen was one of the agents who interrogated Hall. We thought he was surprisingly calm under the circumstances. Uh, you know, very rarely do somebody, three FBI men or two men, FBI men are going to come and ask you to come down to the office for an interview. He handled it really quite well. Uh, and he made no admissions against interest except there were some conflicts between what Sachs said and he, he said, and we 
we got that information back and forth, of course, among us. Uh, but the uh, interviews uh, did not produce any information that we could take to the United States Attorney uh, to get an indictment. The most incriminating evidence against Hall, the deciphered cable documents, could not be used in court. The government did not want it known that the Soviet codes had been cracked. If Klaus Fuchs had not confessed, he too might have remained a free man. Ted Hall had successfully dodged the bullet. We had hoped, of course, that one or the other would break under, under uh, interview. And if, if Sachs had broken, then he would have testified against Hall or vice versa. It didn't happen. Sometimes you get confessions and sometimes you don't. Although the FBI strategy failed with Hall and Sachs, it succeeded with David Greenglass. Not only did he confess, but he implicated Julius and Ethel Rosenberg, who were ultimately executed for espionage in 1953. The Halls were devastated. And they thought, this could be Ted. This could be us, and this could be our children who are about to lose their parents. Um, so they were, you know, very distraught at that time. After spending several years doing cancer research in the United States, Hall, his wife Joan, and their newborn daughter moved to England in 1962. There, Hall worked on electron microscope research at Cambridge University. In 1995, when the deciphered Venona documents were finally made public, Washington Post journalist Michael Dobbs visited Ted Hall. He confirmed that uh, he had worked at Los Alamos during the war. He confirmed some of the details in the Venona documents. He wouldn't confirm that uh, he had actually spied for the Soviet Union, but neither did he deny it very uh, vociferously. Uh, he also made no secret of the fact that he had uh, left-wing sympathies and had been a uh, sympathizer with the Communist Party. So it all added up in my mind as he being a very obvious candidate for the identity of the Soviet spy blood. Many historians, journalists, and those who had personally encountered Hall have cast his legacy in a similar fashion. He's gotten away with giving the secrets of the atomic bomb to the Soviet Union. And uh, he's gotten away with a crime that uh, the Rosenbergs were executed for. But times have changed, and uh, perhaps the Rosenbergs wouldn't have been executed in the kind of intellectual environment that exists today. So I think Ted Hall was very lucky that uh, his story came out, not in the late 40s or early 50s, uh, but in the 90s, after the end of the Cold War. And I think that's, in the end, what saved him. He lied to us. The fact that he did has been confirmed by later transcriptions of the Venona papers, you know. And then another thing that really bothers me is the fact that this is a country that sheltered his forebearers. They came from Russia. And this is a country that is so devoted to the rule of law that he was allowed to go free. We advised him of his right not to make a statement, that he had the right to counsel, that he could stop at any time if he chose. Those rights would not have been afforded to him in the country that he wanted to help. He would simply have been executed. Today, retired in his 70s, Hall continues to reside in England. Although there is no statute of limitations restricting indictment for espionage, it is highly unlikely that Hall's case will ever be brought to court. The government would have a terribly hard time 50 years later trying to get the Vonona documents introduced in evidence in a criminal proceeding. Can you imagine what uh, a defense lawyer could do trying to uh, f attack the credibility of these documents when they're, uh, the code breakers who, who did these decryptions are now in their 70s and 80s, 
when it was a matter of art uh, rather than precise translation in the first place. Ted Hall recently issued statements to journalists Joseph Albright, Marsha Kunstel, and to the producers of this program. Although Hall, for understandable legal reasons, refuses to admit that he spied, he has never denied it. His statements, however, leave little room for doubt. In 1944, I was 19 years old. Immature, inexperienced, and far too sure of myself, I recognize that I could easily have been wrong in my judgment of what was necessary, and that I was indeed mistaken about some things, in particular my view of the nature of the Soviet state. The world has moved on a lot since then, and so have I. But in essence, from the perspective of my 71 years, I still think that brash youth had the right end of the stick. I am no longer that person, but I am by no means ashamed of him. I suspect that Mr. Hall, Dr. Hall, is still wrestling with his, uh, however many years later it has been, uh, because uh, uh, the, uh, this belated explanation comes only because of his exposure. Uh, had Venona not been opened up, had Albright and Kunzer not uh, written their book, uh, I doubt very seriously that Ted Hall would even today want to explain to the world what he had done as a young man. Some historians may remember Ted Hall as the luckiest spy who ever lived. Others may deem him a traitor. Regardless of those opinions, the study of Ted Hall's life provides a rare glimpse into the darkest corners of espionage, corners that only see light when we go in search of history.